Okay, so hormone clearance. Um, you know, hormones are secreted, as we've said. Um, then and eventually they're cleared from the bloodstream. Remember, of course, which ones are going to be cleared faster? The hydrophobic or the hydrophilic? Stop the video, think about that, come back. Right, the hydrophilic are going to get cleared faster because they're soluble in the blood, so the kidney is filtering them out. But the, um, the hydrophobic are bound to transport hormones, which the kidney can't filter out, so they tend to last a lot longer. So hormone signals have to be turned off, taken up and degraded by the liver and the kidney, both. Excreted in the bile, if it's the liver, and excreted in the urine, if it's the kidney. You can talk about the metabolic clearance rate, and uh, I'm not going to say much more about that, any more about that, in fact. Um, Half-life. So that's how much time it takes to clear 50% of the drug from your body. So we can talk about the number of half-lives. So after one half-life, you cleared 50%. After two half-lives, you cleared another 50% of that. So 50% of 50% would be 25%. Do you see what I'm saying? After one half-life, you cleared half of it. You have not only half, le half, half left. If you clear half of that, that'll be a fourth of it. All right. And then after three half-lives, you're down to 12 and a half. After four, you're down to, what would that be? Six and a fourth. Um, and then after five, you're down to three and an eighth. By the time you get to six, you're down to like one and a half. So kind of as a rule of thumb, they often say that, you know, you figure a drug is mostly cleared after about five half-lives. And um, when you take a drug, you know, like aspirin or whatever over the counter, um, when you see that it says you can take it every four to six hours, in many cases, that's it's just based on a calculation of that drug's half-life. Different drugs are cleared more or less easily by your body and so you know they do the research and they figure out okay after you know four hours you will have cleared most of the drug maybe five six half lives something like that okay so um, we said before that um, hormones had specificity and saturation okay that generally speaking hormones will bind only to the receptor for that hormone and there are only a certain number of receptors and once you filled up all the receptors with hormone then additional hormone is not going to have any sort of an effect so what will happen over time, though, is if you, for example, have long-term use of high pharmacological doses, your body starts to adapt. This is homeostasis. Your body starts going, whoa, there's a lot more hormone around here than there used to be. And so your body adjusts. So what can happen is then sometimes that hormone will start binding to the receptor sites of related hormones. All right, so steroid hormones may cross interact when something like that happens. Um, target cells can convert to a different hormone. This is why high chronic levels of hormones um, can produce some weird effects um, because your body starts changing in response to the high levels. Low receptor density may lead to upregulation. So what happens is if you have, uh, there you see in the uh, upper left hand on the left side, uh, low receptor density, weak response. So if you don't have many receptors, you're going to have a weak response to the hormone. So what your body will start doing is it'll start making more receptors. That's called upregulation. And likewise, if you're having too much of an effect in the lower left, um, you can have downregulation. Your body will actually take away receptors. Um, they keep changing their ideas about how this works. But one time, like the SSRIs, that was thought to be what was going on. I haven't followed it recently. But, you know, when you take an antidepressant, a serotonin selective reuptake inhibitor, they usually will tell you that, you know, don't expect to go home today, pop a couple, and suddenly your depression is going to go away. It may take weeks before the drug will have an effect. And why is that the case? Well, what's going to happen is, is once you start taking a reuptake inhibitor, you're going to have a lot more... Um, of the neurotransmitter in the synapse. And so what does your body do? It responds by down-regulating the number of receptors. And that seems to be perhaps correlated with the actual clinical effect. It's not, doesn't, it's not right away. It's when your body finally adapts and down-regulates the receptors that you start to have an effect of that drug. Hormones can interact with one another, as I just said. Generally, there, remember, there is specificity, but under certain conditions, they can start to cross-react, okay? 
Most cells are sensitive to more than one hormone and exhibit interactive effects. So even though the receptors are unique, cells respond to many different hormones, and sometimes that can start to, there can be some interaction. Synergistic effects, two hormones work together to produce an effect greater than the sum of their individual effects. So, for example, follicle-stimulating hormone, testosterone, combined to produce 300,000 sperm per minute. God, that's a scary thought, isn't it? Um, whereas neither alone can stimulate significant production. Permissive effects where one kind of helps the other one, enhances it. Estrogen stimulates the upregulation of progesterone receptors in the uterus. And antagonistic effects. We saw this before with insulin and glucagon, didn't we? They antagonize each other. All right, so no big deal here, just showing you that there is interaction and interplay between hormones, okay? Synergy, permissive, and antagonist. Paracrines, you talked about this way back in Bio 156, and we talked about it at the beginning of this endocrine physiology stuff. So remember, you have hormones, which by definition, what's, how do they travel? Stop the video, yeah, in the blood. Paracrines are cell to cell. They're, they're local. You know, some trucking companies are local and long distance. So hormones are long distance. Paracrines are local. Chemical messages to few short distances. Unlike neurotransmitters, not produced in neurons, okay? Unlike hormones, not transported in the blood. Um, a few examples. So histamine from mast cells and connective tissue. Remember, Part of the immune response, histamine, um, when it's released, will affect nearby cells. Causes relaxation of blood vessel, smooth muscle, causes the vasodilation. Nitric oxide, a gas from the endothelium of blood cells, causes vasodilation. Um, somatostatin within the pancreatic islets. Okay, so delta cells secrete um, somatostatin. It travels to nearby alpha and beta cells and inhibits the release of insulin and glucagon. Catecholamines will do this, and this is what we mentioned before, that under long-term stress, um, the catecholamines from the adrenal, adrenal medulla may diffuse to the adrenal cortex, and um, they can then cause, uh, the, as, as we mentioned, the release of cortisol and aldosterone and things like that, and there you get some of the chronic effects of hypertension. And by the way, nitric oxide is... Um, not what you get at the dentist's office. That's nitrogen dioxide, NO2. This is different. Nitric oxide is, nitric oxide is NO. So eicosanoids. This is a huge class of compounds, but they're extremely important in the human body. You can see in the bottom right there a whole book on just the eicosanoids. So we've seen many of these before. So leukotrienes, all right? Converted from arachidonic acid by lipoxygenase. Lipo, lipoxygenase. Yeah, that's a wonderful word, isn't it? Um, those mediate allergic and inflammatory reactions. Prostacyclin by cyclooxygenase. We saw this before um, in the blood vessels. Inhibits blood clotting and vasoconstriction. This is why you're not randomly forming spurious blood clots all the time. Thromboxanes we saw before. All right, remember, produced by blood platelets, plate, blood platelets after injury um, over the oride prostacyclin. Um, stimulates vasoconstriction and clotting, all right? Von Willebrand factor and all that stuff, remember when we talked about the blood? Prostaglandins we've seen before as well. Um, PGE relaxes smooth muscle in the bladder, intestines, bronchioles, uterus, and stimulus, uh, stimulates contraction of blood vessels. PGF has opposite effects. Ooh, I talked over that. Um, remember, prostaglandins were uh, pyrogens, or pyrogens uh, caused the re uh, release of um, prostaglandins, they helped to uh, moderate fever. So, I coast, this is a great slide, actually. That diagram on the left is incredibly informative, and it, it's going to explain something really important. Um, it's going to explain, well, well, we'll see right now. Anti-inflammatory drugs interfere with eicosanoid synthesis, all right? So they interfere with all those things, prostacyclins, prostaglandins, all that kind of stuff, leukotrienes. The SEDs, the steroidal anti-inflammatories, they block the release of arachidonic acid. So you see at the top of the diagram on the left, arachidonic acid coming from the phospholipid bilayer, um, it's going to block that very first step. Um, cortisol and the steroidal anti-inflammatories block that first step. So notice they block then the formation of arachidonic acid. These are incredibly powerful. They block leukotriene synthesis and lead to immune system suppression, okay? So you can see they're following down. 
they're going to block both of the lower pathways, both the lipoxygenase and the cyclooxygenase. So they're going to prevent or inhibit leukotrienes as well as thromboxanes, prostacyclin, and prostaglandins. Prolonged use causes the Cushing-like side effects. All right, that's one of the problems of long-term steroidal uh, drug use. The NSAIDs, the non-steroidals, notice aspirin, ibuprofen, naproxen, they only block that pathway on the lower right. Um, so they don't interfere with the leukotrienes. They interfere with the thromboxanes. That's why you've got that aspirin therapy, right, if you uh, have a high risk of forming clots. And the prostacyclin, again, same thing, um, inhibits blood clotting. And the prostaglandins and prostaglandins, pain, inflammation, um, so that's why, you know, aspirin is antipyretic, lowers fever, it's analgesic, um, uh, prevents pain, and anti-inflammatory as well. So prostaglandins involved in inflammation. So as you can see there, um, that's why the, the steroids are so much more powerful, and that's why they're prescription only generally, all right? They have much more profound effects, and they can inhibit immune function, they are immunosuppressive with long-term use. That's why aspirin is over-the-counter, doesn't mess with that stuff. Let's look at some endocrine disorders here, and first just some basic categories. What, what are the possibilities here? We're talking about variations in hormone concentration, target cell sensitivity. Um, they can have noticeable effects on the body. So first it's possible to have hyposecretion. Not enough hormones can be released. Could be a tumor, a lesion, all right? Um, one example, a fractured sphenoid may sever the hypothalamal hypophysial tract, preventing the release of antidiuretic hormone. I had a girl in my class a few years back. She was in an automobile accident, and she um, fractured a sphenoid, ethmoid, up in that area. It got some head trauma. And she actually leaked cerebrospinal fluid. So sometimes when she would sneeze, She'd like look in the handkerchief and there's some cerebrospinal fluid. I mean, it just looked like water. But I mean, she got a test and went to the doctor and she was actually leaking cerebrospinal fluid. So in this case, um, if the preventing the release of ADH, that's one of the things that can lead to diabetes insipidus, condition of polyuria. So remember, that's not diabetes mellitus. There's no insulin involved, no glucose involved here. This is just an inhibition of ADH, therefore you produce more urine, so you pee all the time. Remember, that's what the word diabetes actually means. It means you pee all the time. Insipidus, by the way, the root word insipid means dull or tasteless. So this is the tasteless. Diabetes mellitus is the sweet diabetes. Diabetes insipidus is the tasteless diabetes. And hypersecretion, so if you're secreting too much, this can cause some big trouble. Tumors or autoimmune disorders, and what you're seeing in the lower left there, um, a condition called toxic goiter or Graves' disease. In this case, it's an autoimmune disorder in which your immune system makes antibodies that look like thyroid stimulating hormone. So remember, thyroid stimulating hormone is an anterior pituitary hormone that goes to the thyroid, causes the release of thyroid hormone, also causes the thyroid gland to grow. So in this case, the thyroid is constantly getting bombarded by TSH, so it just grows and grows and grows and grows and gets bigger until you have what you have on the left. Notice this is not the same as the iodine deficiency goiter, all right? That's when you couldn't make enough iodine. This is an autoimmune condition. So pituitary disorders, remember we said pituitary was the master gland of the endocrine system. So you start messing around with the pituitary, um, we can have potentially big trouble. And especially, again, hypersecretion or hypo. But a uh, big problem here is growth hormone. So um, you can secrete too little or too much. Um, if the problem happens in adulthood, you end up with acromegaly. Acro high, megaly, large. So if you have acromegaly, you are high and large. You are a big, tall person, and you are big and wide. Um, so not necessarily tall. Depends, again, exactly when it happens. Because remember, after uh, puberty, the epiphyseal plates close, and so you can't really grow taller, but you can grow wider. So, um, I mean, the bones themselves grow in diameter. So look in the illustration there, this woman, over the course of her life, um, her face and her head just keep getting bigger and bigger. Her, her bones are growing uh, in width and appositional growth, but um, 
they're not she's not growing taller so it's just people with acromegaly end up with big spaces between their teeth they end up with big huge heads um, big hands big feet thickening of the bone and soft tissues if the problems occur in childhood not adolescence we get something slightly different so gigantism or giantism if hypersecretion as a child uh, dwarfism of hyposecretion so these are just two growth disorders then caused by a pituitary disorder it could be a tumor it could be other things as well so there's Andre the Giant um, the wrestler and the Princess Bride which I can't believe a lot of people have never seen what a great movie put that on your list watch it it's a fun movie and you'll like it everybody does um, but Andre the Giant, uh, if you don't know about him or haven't seen him, Google some pictures of Andre the Giant. It's really something to see him standing next to other people. I mean, he is massive. I mean, this guy is big beyond comprehension. You should Google that, Andre the Giant. Um, and that's what happens. Apparently, as I, from what I can tell, he had gigantism as a child, but then he had hypersecretion of growth hormone, and that continued into adulthood, so he continued to grow again appositionally so he ended up just being a massively huge human being and by all our accounts a real sweetheart too so I don't know here you see acromegaly um, the guy on the left is very famous I don't remember his name um, Sid always does I can't remember guy on the right just look at him for a second with I assume his mom look at the size of his feet all right um, well, it looks like it's Photoshop doesn't it um, his feet are bigger than his mom's head if that is his mom, whatever. And, uh, you know, dwarfism, just short stature. I don't know. The, I don't, the terminology keeps changing. I don't know. But um, it doesn't mean anything except you don't grow tall. I mean, you're still perfectly normal, live a normal life. Okay, which statement is false? Icosanoids are paracrine secretions. Thyroid hormone is a monoamine. Hydrophobic hormones require transport proteins. Catecholamine hormones are synthesized from cholesterol. Cortisol is a steroid. Four of those are true. One is false. Pause the video. Come back when you're ready. Yeah, catecholamines are not synthesized from cholesterol. Those are the steroid hormones that are made from cholesterol. Catecholamine, remember, that's a, that's a mono. Those are monoamine hormones hormones from tyrosine okay and uh, oh yeah there's the Spencer Trail that's you're looking into um, uh, Glen Canyon there Glen Canyon Dam is further around the corner up to the left this is right at the start of the Grand Canyon uh, but the Spencer Trail is an awesome trail God, it's a brutal trail it's like 1700 feet ascent in like one mile so it's incredibly steep and I hike it in July and so even though I start like at 5 in the morning um, by the time I got done, it is hot, and it is just oppressive. And it is so steep, the drop-offs are hundreds of feet. And sometimes the trail, look at the trail on the left, see how narrow that is? And that trail is not a level trail. Um, there are places on the Spencer Trail, where I, I've hiked it three times now, where literally I'm like digging my fingers into the sides of the wall to try to prevent myself from sliding off the edge and plummeting hundreds of feet to my death. But at least it would be at the Grand Canyon, so what the heck. Okay, kids, see you later.